started. We're going to be looking at the image of God, um, what it is, how it, how it, I guess, its application in your life, and we're using kind of the Ten Commandments to, uh, to, uh, I guess, really describe what the image of God is and what it looks like. Uh, has everyone been here? Like, is, who's who's not been here for the last two Sundays? Has everybody been here for the last two Sundays? I can't recall. Well, we t we've looked at basically, I guess, the question, the big question that I ask is, what makes someone broken? And, when, you know, you've, you've probably looked at somebody and they're like, that's a broken person. Well, what makes that person broken? Well, it is, it's sin. And whenever you start looking at sin, what you have when, you know, James says, and I think it's James 2 and 2.10, it says that if you fail in one respect of the law, you're guilty of the whole. And, you know, and I was actually having a discussion with Kaylin uh, this week. And just, you know, I've already, already said this verse, but I got, like, new revelation, I guess, on it, uh, for the lack of better terms, or a new understanding, is that whenever you misapply one aspect of the image, it really affects all the rest of the image. You know, how you, you know, how you view the image of God. Like, uh, do you worship God the right way, or are you making unto yourself a graven image? Um, are you take, really taking his name in vain? Do you really honor your father or your mother the right way if you don't properly, you know, understand, you know, what it what God's desire is for you to, you know, not steal. And we're going to look at those kind of things tonight. Especially whenever we start looking at uh, adultery. Uh, everybody was here for the for the adultery? I think everybody was here. Were you here, Jacob, last week? You think so? Oh, yeah, Isaac and Caden were. So, yeah, it was a, I think it was really good to understand how, how marriage and the image of God correlate to each other. So uh, we're going we're gonna to go down to the uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15 tonight. That's where we're going to start. We're going to look at three, the final three um, commandments and how they relate to the image of God. So Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15. Micah, you got that? What verse? Verse 15, Exodus 20. I thought you were there. <clears throat> You're there? Go ahead, Isaac. Exodus 20 and 15. You shall not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> Micah should have just quoted it. So, how do, whenever you look at uh, stealing, stealing, the commandment of stealing, how do you think that that affects the, the image of God? I'm asking you to think a little bit deep. I know, I know even college students, they, they have to brush off some... Some rust whenever it comes to thinking deep in spiritual things sometimes, right? What, how does stealing affect, like, well, let's, let's think about what is, what is really, what is, what is stealing? What is it really about? What's going on when somebody steals? Taking something that doesn't belong to them. They're taking something that doesn't belong to them, right? Um, why would somebody steal? Why would they do that? Envy, greed. Why don't they just go buy it? They can't afford it. Maybe Sometimes they, they can't afford it, right? Maybe they don't think the other... Sometimes it's something you can't buy. You don't see why stuff you want and you can't buy. Yeah. What were you going to say, Isaac? Maybe they don't want the other or don't care if that other party has it. Yeah, they, they don't think that they de that other person deserves it, right? And they don't want to work for it themselves. You know, that's another thing, right? I'd say that's probably the big picture about stealing. Uh, I don't want to work for it. I don't want to spend my money on it. Even if I got the money, I don't want to spend my money on it. I don't want to work for it. I just think somebody should give it to me. In fact, if they won't give it to me, I'll just take it. They don't have to give it to me. I'll just take it. So what, is, what do you think God says about work? He wants his man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Man doesn't work, doesn't want to eat. Look, I want to show you the first verse that God talks about it. Look in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3.
Genesis chapter 2, 2 and 3. Do you have that, Madison? Genesis chapter 2? Yeah, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested in all the work of creating, or from all the work of creating that he had done. Right. God is a worker. Okay? So if God is a worker, would you, you think he wants you to be a worker? If he's put his image inside of you and he is a worker, then what does that say about you? He wants you to be a worker too. Just as much as he is a worker, he wants you to be a worker. So really, when it comes to stealing, what we're looking at, it's a denial of, of how God has made you. Y'all agree with that? If you're going to be a thief, you are actually denying the way that God has made you. Rather than working for it, I'm going to take it. I'm going to show you something. Because I believe that thieving, stealing, is probably the ultimate satanic act. Now, hold on. Hold that in your on your thoughts for a second. You're like, even worse than murder. Well, you know, Satan tried to replace God. Tried to take God's. He did. Well, he well, what? I mean, really, when you look when you look at what murder is, murder is the taking of a life that doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an act of theft of thieving. Look in John chapter ten and verse ten. You got it, Caden? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and read that. Okay. <clears throat> the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more. So here, Jesus, he's, he, he's talking about thieves, and we know that the devil is a thief. And Jesus, this is, these are Jesus' words. He's coming to steal, kill, destroy. Absolutely. Saint, it, this, is really, this is really an attribute of, 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 of a satanic mindset. To steal, kill, and destroy. That's why I say that a, it's really a denial of how God has made you. And it is the ultimate satanic act. So if you're going to be a thief, you are really bowing down to Satan in, um, in the most um, profound way. It, you, you go that direction, it's not going to be long before killing comes, before destruction comes. I mean, you still, you, and, and sometimes it's not even a person. You can steal from, you know, a lot of times we see like drug, drug addicts that they'll steal from their family. You know what really is going on when they steal from their family? They're killing the relationship they have with their family. They're destroying it. So you're just um, saying that it's almost like a snowball effect kind of thing, that like it leads to another thing and another thing and then another thing. Absolutely. If you're a thief, you will, you fail. You really, every, every commandment that God has, it, it's just, a, it, they're just, they're just collapsing like dominoes. When you go down that road. It's like you just, you're not going to do anything right. Everything in your life is about to fall apart. That's, that's really where uh, this, this thing comes out. And you're like, man, I never looked at it that it was all that bad. It, it really is an ultimate sat satanic act in your life. Um, bad things are coming your way. Bad things are coming your way. I want to show you one more verse in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Ephesians 4 and 28. You got it, Micah? Hey, I'll let you read that one. Let him that is stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands, the which, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that he. All right. 
Right. So the Apostle Paul, he's like, quit taking from others, work hard so that you can get it for yourself, and then be willing to give to others. That's really that's that's really what the Apostle Paul says. That's what that's what work is about. It's about God giving you the ability to, to take care, you know, of of the needs that and the needs and wants in your own life, but not just the needs and the wants in your own life, but to so make it where you can further prove, uh, help others. Further prove that's a demonic act or a, a, a satanistic act. The verse right before that says, "Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more." Yep. Yeah, you you see how all this stuff seems to be connected with uh, uh, together. I mean, it's just. Really, the image of God just has just really just started coming to life in, in my mind and what it means. And the commandments, I think, do a really good job of painting the picture of, especially with this one, how does stealing relate to the image of God? So what do you think? We've gone through all this stuff. What do you think? How does stealing reflect the, go against the image of God or how does it, how does it correlate? What is it, Isaac? Yeah, well, well, what's really going on inside of you? It's not that you just don't want to steal. It's there's something else inside of you. It's like you described you earlier, the snowball effect. It's yeah, if you steal, what's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of stealing? Giving. To give and, but to be able to give, you, you've got you've to be able to do work. something else. You've got to work, right? That's the image of God that we're looking at. Work. Stealing just says, thou shalt not steal. When really what God is saying, I mean, that's the negative attribute of it, but really what God is saying, thou shalt be a worker. You know, we always look at the negative connotations of, of the commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Man, that's negative. Stealing is negative. Okay, thou shalt be a worker. And if you're not a worker, you're a thief. Does that make sense? That's what we're saying. The image of God is to be a worker, a good worker, a hard worker, a worker that is willing to provide for the needs of of those around him and to be a giver at the same time. Because God's a giver, God's a worker. He wants you to be a giver and a worker. Make sense? All right. Let's look at the next one. Bearing false witness. Look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. Anybody want to quote that verse for me? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Man, that's an easy one in it, Brother Sean. Against thy neighbor. Against, against, thy neighbor. against who? Thy neighbor. Oh, who? Who's my neighbor? Everybody. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's really what we're looking at in this. It's just like, you know, you always wonder, right, whenever, um, whenever the, the rich young ruler came up to Jesus and, and asked, you know, who's, was it, was it him? No, it was something else. But, uh, but Jesus, that one of them justifies himself, right? He wants to say, well, well, who's my neighbor? I've kept all the commandments, but who is ruling my neighbor? So that's what we're going to look at. Look in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39. Matthew 22, 37 and 39. Crying just means they're alive. I can, I can read it if you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't bear. So really what we're looking at. So, all right. So what are we looking at? Let's say, you know. We've got this commandment that says, bear, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. We're looking at who is our neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. How does that relate to the image of God? What are we looking at? It's unconditional love that Christ showed us so that he's wanting us to. Exactly, because what does he see when he sees people? Unconditional. We're all the same. Yeah, say a, say a little bit louder, Sean. He sees his image. Right. He, you know, he's looking at those people that that maybe they have some issues, but God, but God is not looking just at the issues. He's looking at somebody who's made in his own image. 
So the way it relates is, how do you see people? Right? Do you see a thief? Do you see an adulterer? Do you see a murderer? Or do you see an image bearer? Or do you see an image bearer? Right? That's what this means. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, what do you think it means to bear false witness against thy neighbor? What does that mean? It means not to, to lie about them, but it's, that it's, it's deeper than that, though. It's like not to give a false, you know, to, in the context of what we're talking about, it's don't put a false image on them that is not there. You know, the image bearer of God, don't, don't put them in the image of Satan. You know, see them in the image of God. So, you know, don't bear that false witness against them. So you basically putting that image on them when you do that, but um, you know, God wants us to see see his image on people. He wants us to see the reflection of him within everybody, even if they're broken. You know, he wants us to look past the brokenness and see the image of God that's reflected back from them. And, um, how, the way, can, the how, can, does, how can we do that, though? The how way, can we... The way, the way he does us, he, you know, he, he forgives us. We forgive them like he forgave us. You know, it's kind of like what Jesus said, you know, forgive those who trespass against you. Um, you know, if you don't, then God's going to forgive you. You know, that's what we call us that in the Lord's Prayer. But, uh, but you have to be able to look past and forgive their, their transgressions. Yeah, that, and you know what? That's going to be hard sometimes. Because how do you look past somebody that's done you really, really wrong? You see, bearing false witness is you not looking at them the way that God wants you to look at them. You look at them, <coughs> they're a liar, they're a thief, they're a fornicator, they're yeah, bad, the they're child. bad news. I tell you what, it, it's, it's tough for me, especially mm -hmm. to look at some of our politicians these days and look at them and say, they're made in the image of God instead of just being, they're just scumbags. You know, that's me being honest. Because when I look at them, I'm like, I can't see any good in them. But the truth, the real, and you see, the problem, the problem with that way of thinking is, is that to myself, this is where the problem comes in, is that I'm bearing false witness of those people. You know, maybe in this world, they're, they're not very good. But what if, what if God's love could penetrate their hearts? Would they be worth saving? Yep. Is anybody worth saving? Is there anybody beneath the love of God and him being able to save them? No. No. And that's bear, that is whenever you bear false witness, that's you looking at them as somebody God can't save them. And you looking at them. <coughs> of course, if you believe that that person is unsavable, all you see, all you see is they're a liar, they're scum, they're worthless. They're pathetic. The best thing, the best thing that should would ha could happen with that person is for them to die. And, that, right? and doing that hinders you from being a godly influence in their life. When you could be bringing them the message of repentance and salvation, you're you're standing back and judging them instead. Instead of bringing, instead of fulfilling the commitment that God had to commit to, whenever He gave us the Great Commission, you know, He told us to go and, and give the good news, you know, the gospel. So if you as somebody that you look at that way, you're not going to give them the gospel. You know, you're not, and you're not going to. If you do, you're going to do it half-heartedly. You're not going to have your heart in it. So, right. You know. So uh, it hinders the gospel by looking at people that way. Yeah, and if you look at somebody like that, then you're gonna you're gonna struggle to see uh, to see anything but the badness and the lies. In fact, you'll even lie you'll even lie to yourself about you know their their potential. Okay, does that make sense? So it's not like you know lying about somebody's, you know, just just a piece. It's a it's a very small piece of the big picture of what bearing false witness is all about. Yeah. Bearing false witness is how do you witness this person in your own mind and heart? Can you see them worth anything? And really, whenever well, the way it relates to God's image is, you know, we should promote God's image in, in others. 
okay? Everybody is worth God's love. Everybody is worth saving. Will everybody be saved? Unfortunately, no. But that doesn't mean that we don't try, that we try to promote the image of God in other people. And those people that you initially judge as, as irredeemable um, might actually be the ones that are most apt to receive the gospel message. From right. Them. The Apostle Paul, he... And he would have been he would have been one of those cases, right? Mm -hmm. He was a murderer. He, he said, was a thief. He said amongst sinners, he was, I'm chief. Yeah, he broke, and he realized he broke every one of the commandments because he didn't even have the right image of God in his mind. He didn't have the right picture of God to be even begin with. Is, it, is this making sense on how these things relate to the image of God? Yeah, I tell you, it's going to change your perspective whenever you read the scriptures from now on. If you can, if you can really get this understanding inside your mind. So, is everybody tracking with me so far? We're gonna look at one more. We're gonna look at one more. Look at coveting. Look at Exodus chapter twenty and verse seventeen. Yeah. You got it. What does yeah. it say? Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, <coughs> thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not cover nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, or anything that is thy neighbor. All right, so we look at this coveting thing. Uh, from the top of your head, you know, from what, what, I guess, maybe from your feelings, what do you think is going on with, with coveting and the image of God? Like, what, what do you think is deep down? What, what's behind the breaking of that image, that portion of the image? When you're coveting, what is really going on? What's breaking in that person? Read, the, read those final things again. Read them slow so everybody can get them. Uh, that's not covered by neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor okay. his Okay, stop for a second. His wife, his manservant, his maidservant. What are we talking about? Um, his wife? No. Yeah, what are we talking about? Why, why would it say his wife? And then say his manservant, his that's slaves. The things that help him do the work around the house. Or, or coveting means the desire to want something. I guess that in that aspect, it's desiring to want something that isn't yours. So then you're, it's going to lead to almost a jealousy thing where you're trying to take that from that Okay, person. So, so you desire something that's not yours for a jealousy type thing. Um, what, what, is, what does that really mean, though? Like, why would you be jealous of someone else's wife? Why would you be jealous? Because you're not satisfied with your own. You're not satisfied. So when you're not satisfied with the, what God has originally given you, what are you saying about God? That he hasn't provided adequately for you. That he is not the provider, right? I'm missing out. Look at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Exodus 3 and verse 14. You have it, Joy? Or Caden? Yeah, have you read Caden? Yeah. Noah, do you have it? Yeah. Go ahead and read that, Noah. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, So sh shall go say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. All right. Tell me what I'm thinking. Why would I reference that verse? In regards of coveting and all the things that we've just talked about. Because if you're not satisfied, then that also means that you're not satisfied with who God is, I guess, too. And then even though God says he is who he says he is. Right. And, and what does that what does that mean that God that God when you're God calling says God a liar. Hmm? You're calling God a liar. You're calling God a liar. Yeah, you're saying that he is not who he says he is. He's not who he says he is. And he's the provider. We've seen that in Jehovah Jireh. Whenever we look at the I am that I am, we're looking at this, you know, and I keep saying, I keep you're saying, saying you're this. Not, you're not who you're not. You're, you're not who you say you are. Right. Yeah. You're not who you're not. I am means that I am who you need me to be. Does that make sense? So if you need a wife giver, God is the wife giver. If you need a servant giver, God is a servant giver. If you need a house, God is the house giver. What what else is in there? If you need a ride, God is the ride giver. Yeah. Okay. So 
you're looking oh, for stuff in the wrong place. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You're looking for stuff in the wrong place. You're desiring stuff in the wrong place. Right. You wrong don't place. believe. Basically, you're saying, I don't believe that God can take care of what I need. Or, I, or that or what he has given me isn't good enough. Or what, yeah, I'm missing out yeah. on something. What what God has given he's me. He's given that person something better than he's given me. Is how, you, how, you, how you're looking at it. You're looking at it, well, I, if God's the provider, why do you give them that and give me this? You know, I'm, it, why is mine not as good as theirs? You know, it's, it's, it's just a... You're not you're not relying on the Lord. You're not trusting in the Lord. Right. So you don't. So if you if you are coveting, you do not believe that God is. I am, that I am. Does that make sense? Yeah. I want to give. I want to show you some other verses. In Genesis chapter three, and verse five. Can you look at that? This is the first experience. Okay. God. Uh, this is one of the the final the final uh, commandments. But this is the one that sent mankind spiraling out of control, okay? So, Genesis 3 and verse 5. Joy, do you have that? Uh-huh. <coughs> 3-5? Yeah, 3-5. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. So why, what's coveted? What's what's going on in this verse that's covetous? Well, that's the, when there was a person trying to manipulate and saying like, oh, like you're, um, it's not a big deal if you don't eat from the fruit even though God told you not to. So it's kind of coveting the fruit or like coveting the power that God is supposed to have Coveting knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, what's, what's, the, what's really, what, what does he say? That you'll be as what? God's as coveting God's position. Yeah, you're coveting God. They they were coveting God's position to be able to understand everything about good and evil. And they so so do you see how that was coveting in there? That's that's the lure that Satan did. Now they didn't. It wasn't a sin until they acted on it. Okay, that's what James tells us. Is it, because in that act, you're telling God that what He's given you isn't good enough. Garden that you give me in the in the in the in the the, the status in, in the on the earth that you've given mankind, you know, to rule over the plants and the uh, animals, and you know, the, you're telling God, well, I I want your spot, you know, you're 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 committing the same sin Satan committed, you know, you want God's spot, you don't want to, you're not satisfied with your own spot or the status that He's given you, so you want to take His, you want to steal from God, right? <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of things going on with that, right? Do you see how, uh, when I was telling you about James uh, 2 and 10, how when you fail in one respect, it leads you down that path where you break everything. You know, you, you just can't break well, one piece out. It's not a chip. Well, that's also, um, in the reverse of that is when Jesus said, love your, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. Right. He's telling you everything hinges on these, on these two. So if, if you miss one of these, then you're going to be guilty of all of it. Yeah, it's just the it's just the collapse of, of the of the legal system, so to speak. Um, I don't I didn't have this in my notes, but I want to read it to you in James chapter one. And I just I just lost it. I had my finger on it. Verse fourteen. I'll let you I'll let you, everyone get there. James chapter one and verse fourteen. If you mark in your Bibles, this is a really good spot for you to mark or to highlight. One fourteen. Yeah, 1 and 14. Actually, 13. We'll start at 13. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Okay, the temptation is not the sin, okay? You can be tempted. Adam and Eve were tempted. That wasn't the sin. Every man is tempted when... Every, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So he's not going to... God is not going to tempt you to do evil. Are there? Does God tempt you? Yes. He tempts you in a way to give you a choice of what are you going to do with God's word. What are you going to do with the image that God has given you? Are you going to Are you going to advance in it, or are you going to Are you going to break it, so to speak? But God doesn't put you in a position where you 
have to sin or he doesn't tempt you with sin, he may put you in a situation and how you respond to the situation. It says that, you know, in another scripture it says that, that with the temptation he gives you uh, a way of avoiding the temptation. Of, right. Of, of, you know, right. A way so, of escape. So what, when God tempts, there's a test. You know, the test is there to grow you to make you a better person. When Satan tempts you, he tempts you to do evil, to sin, to, bro to be broken. God tempts you to do good. He tempts you right. to go against your sin nature. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. He, he's building against it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted to God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every, <coughs> excuse me, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That is why the Apostle Paul would write in Romans, the wages of sin is death. That is always the result of sin. It is the result of brokenness. You're broken, and who knows what other catastrophe goes along with it, okay? So here in Genesis 3 and 5, Satan tempts Adam and Eve with God knowledge. They thought God left something out. He, we could have had so much more. And really what happened when, uh, of course, that, that, that goes down a whole, uh, you know, a whole big pile of nonsense. But really what they did is they lost, they lost knowledge. The gaining of good and evil meant something else. That meant the loss of a lot of other things. Their spirit died that day. That's why our spirit has to be born again. They lost immortality. Right. And now, yeah, they, they no longer could. Their lives, their lives did have an end, and it just plunged mankind down this rabbit hole of sin and wickedness and evil that all of us have to deal with. Jesus got a fix, but it's but the fix is not here yet. It is a promise that we look to in the future, and it is coming, but not here yet. 1 John chapter 2, and verse 16. Another good verse. In fact, all these verses are good that I've, I've given to you. But, um, do you? Go ahead and read it then. 16? Yeah, 1 and 16. 1, 2, 1 John 2 and 16. So these are from the world, all right? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are not from God, okay? Think about that just for a second. Lust of the flesh, how you feel. The lust of when you look at something and it takes, it takes you into a, a, a place that is evil, not from God. Pride of life is not from God. You know what pride of life is? I think those other ones, they're probably, we probably understand what those are. Lust of the flesh, you know what those are? Mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the things that you know, your flesh desires, you know, all the extra stuff that you don't really need that complicates your life, right? Then we have the lust of the eyes. Those are the things that lead you into covetousness. Those are things that I really, really want. That's why, you know, that's why I work so hard so I can get those things. When, But if you have God's perspective, you're a worker, you work, not so that you can get a bunch of things, but so that you can take care of needs, and help others along the way. Now we have the pride of life. What is the pride of life? Man, this is going to hurt people's feelings. I'm sorry, but we're going to go there. Okay? The pride of life. What do you think it is? It's that sense that you have that your life is your own and your own, you're your own master. That you're, you're the master of your world that you live in. You know, that this is my life. That I get to choose what to do what I want right. to do with it. But you're not. You're not the boss of your own life. Right, exactly. God is. So. Yep. That means, you know what, do y'all understand what Brother Sean was saying? That your life belongs to you. 
It does. I feel like I'm giving you your yeah, it is away. it is a gift from God. Okay? Your life does not belong to you. It is a gift from God. That's what makes abortion so wrong. It is not anyone else's, even if you know, even if you're a woman. Okay? Even if you're a woman. The life that's inside of you does not belong to you. You think, oh, this is my body. I can do with what I, my body. That's not your body. Okay? It does not belong to you. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. God is the one who gave that thing, get that to you. That's why Romans 12, and verse 2, that you are supposed to present your body as a living sacrifice. That in life and in death, you serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those things are the pride of life. If you've got the pride of life, that's not from God. What's from God is my life belongs to God, you know? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That is your motivator. And I, and I realize, you know, I got young people that are going to college, and I had the same. And you know what? I was even taught this from, from uh, teachers and preachers and deacons and uh, men and women of God that, you know, I was supposed to go out and I was supposed to get a good education and I was supposed to get a good job and make a ton of money because that would make me happy. And it was a lie. And that's the pride of life. And they were false teachers. And you know what we have? We have a collapsing church because there was a bunch of false teachers in it. And if some of them may read, listen to this and they get offended. I don't care. They, they know that they're wrong now, I think. That they believed the lie of the devil. You shall be as gods. The scripture even acknowledges the fact in, uh, in Psalms, that you're, he says that you, that you, uh, that you are, are gods. Little G's, you're only gods in your mind, but that's, as, that's the best that you're going to get. You can hold on to the pride of life, and you can, you can hold on to the lust of the flesh and the, and the lust of the eyes, and the best that you will have it is in this world. But when you die, you go to a devil's hell for eternity. And that is not for you. That is for the devil and his angels. God has got something better for you. You know what's from God? Eternal life. Do you have the pride of everlasting life? What does that look like? That looks like a giver. For God gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Does that make sense? I want to show you another verse. Matthew 6 and verse 30. Remember, I know I, I kind of went on a little bit of a tangent there. Remember, we're talking about coveting and coveting violates the image of God and that that person does not believe that the person that covets does not believe that God is the great I am, that he is who you need him to be when you need him the most. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30. Isaac, you got that? Now if God so close the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So if God takes is willing to take care of the grass of the field, that really, when you look at the grass of the field, it doesn't really do a whole lot, right? It just covers the dirt with green stuff, but as soon as winter comes, it dies. So it's really, it really doesn't have a lot to offer anybody. But God looks at it, and you even look at it, and you're like, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. If that's true about the grass of the field, why do we get distracted when... God looks at you and he says, you're more beautiful than that. You're better than that. I want to take care of you more than that. 
I am that I am. I've got one final verse. Sarah, would you look up Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19? In fact, everybody look up Philippians 4 and 19. If you come in a couple Sundays, I'll do this verse for you probably. It's going to be it's going to be probably in January, I guess, by the time I get to it. But anyway, Philippians 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But my God shall supply all your needs. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you believe that, you will not have a coveting problem. If God thinks that you need that, he'll give it to you. Now, I want to take a step back from that just a little bit because there's sometimes that there's things that we want, all right? Sometimes there's things that we want. And it's not wrong (coughs) to want things sometimes. When you're wanting God's way, you want to work for it. You're not objecting to working for it. And God will give you what you want. Give him a good list. Okay? I'm going to give you an example. Because I was talking to one of my mentor preachers about this one time. I wanted this truck, all right? I, you know, I sold my truck when I was in Utah, and I was, I was sad. I'd been sad since that thing rolled away, and I had to wave goodbye to it. I had a lot of memories then. And I wanted another truck. I wanted one that could carry my whole family. So I needed a six pack. I wanted one that was less than, uh, that was less than like, I think it, I think it was like eight years old. I wanted one that was less than eight years old. I wanted one that was blue. <laughs> I wanted one that was blue. And there was, I think there was a couple other things like it. And I tell you what, every day I was getting on the computer and I was looking. I'm like, there's got to be one in here. And then I started feeling convicted. I felt like I was coveting. I was being lustful. And I'm like, God, I'm, you know, I don't need this. You know, that'd just be money that I could, you know, I could use for missions or something else. So I just quit. A month later, I get a call. My cousin is selling my truck for the price tag that I looked. I, I wanted it less than $10,000. This was $10,000 on the nose. And there's a scripture that says God will give you the desires of your heart when you desire it his way. When you have the right perspective of God's image in your life. That's what all this has been about. It's not that God is, he's up there and trying to keep his thumb on you, trying, trying to make you a monk. He, you know, he, he doesn't mind you going to school and getting a good education and getting a good job and making money. He's not against that. But you should be doing it. I'm not doing it for those things. I'm doing it so that I can glorify God with my life. And along the way, He is the I am that I am. The God that you need when you need Him the most. That's who He is. And keep the right image of God about all these things. And that's really what the commandments do. Is they just paint a picture of what that image is supposed to look like. Who it is. How to help it develop. And you can trust God. If you'll just, if you'll just leave, trust not in your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge Him. And He will direct your paths. And you're not going to have a problem with these commandments. You know, that's why Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And the reason he could say that is because in you, he wants to conform his image. He wants to grow you in that image. He wants to expound that image. Not like the mindset of, that Satan did, you know, uh, try, to, try to get Adam and Eve to, to do, you know, that you'll eat this fruit, you'll become as God to know good and evil. Jesus wants you to become like his son, to be conformed into his image. And this is what he says. I'm not going to make you God. I'm going to make you the sons of God. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. 
That's what this is all about. So do you have problems with his image? With his commandments? You don't have problems with the commandments. You love the commandments because they paint the picture of his image and you desire to be conformed to that image. What do y'all think? Does that make sense? All right. Well, let's close in prayer. Isaac, would you, would you um, close this? Jesus, I just want to thank you for all that you've given us, what you let us do. just want to please be with uh, this holiday season. A lot of trips are going to be made. Please be with all of those. Your will be done. Amen. I was trying to think of a.